Again, it's good to be here this morning. I uh, appreciate everyone here so very much. Appreciate the invitation to be here uh, from everyone that is here at the Meat Street Church. This morning for our last part of our worship, I want to talk about social networking as it alludes to Christianity. Uh, I'm not sure this lesson would have would have been very pertinent about 30 years ago. I'm just not sure it would have done a lot. But today, this is a lesson that is most needed. I'll be real honest uh, with you. I don't have any social networking platforms myself, but I know how to use some of them, and I know how to look at some of them for information. So I'm not completely ignorant, but I'm also not as well-versed as maybe as I ought to be in some of this. But concerning Scripture and this topic, I think we can do a sufficient job of studying this together. Do you know how many different social networking platforms are being used today? If you say no, you're like everybody else in the world because I don't know that anybody has a, an exact number and it's probably changing all the time. Here are some numbers that I have for you that were relevant recently. Maybe they've changed a little, maybe not, but let's look at this together. Hopefully you can read that screen. If you can't read it, I'm going to try to say it out loud if you can't see some of those smaller words. How many of you have Facebook? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have Facebook? 2.9 billion people use Facebook every day. That's a lot. Do you realize how many people... 2.9 billion people is. That's a lot of people. I, I would challenge you and ask you this question. Do you think 2.9 billion people read their Bible every day? Uh, that, that's a challenge I would ask. TikTok, you know, that's probably the newest fad, the most popular right now. Some of the kids in here might not have ever heard of MySpace, but when I was about 9th or 10th grade, MySpace was the popular one. Uh, it's already faded out. But TikTok averages 1 billion. Instagram, 2 billion. Snapchat, 538 million. YouTube, 2.2 billion. Now that's one I can say I probably use the most is YouTube. WhatsApp, Twitter, Reddit, LinkedIn. Maybe you've heard of these. They're, they're different in ways. I can't give you a perfect description of all of them, but we don't have to know all that to know. These are social networking platforms that are used today and used prevalently. So, what does social networking have to do with being a Christian? I think that's an important question we've got to ask. My daughter, Macy, who loves to get embarrassed during her lessons, turned 13 this year in August. So she, we have a teenager now. I know that it's hard to believe that my wife has a kid that age. It is, it's a little easier to understand that I have a kid that age. But regardless, <laughs> we have a teenager. Well, she finished the, the local elementary school where we live. It's called New Bethel Elementary. It goes through sixth grade. So we told her all that time, we said, if you'll get valedictorian, we'll get you a phone. If you get valedictorian, we'll get you a phone. Well, she got valedictorian. So we, we got, she went to the high school. The high school we live is called Colbert Heights. I think we got a few back there that are familiar with Colbert Heights a little bit. Uh, but regardless, uh, Colbert Heights High School is the, the school where our, our kids will go to high school where we live there. And once we live by New Bethel, maybe a mile. Well, once they go to high school, we live about 15 minutes from high school. So, you know, her plane sports up. Good to have a communication device there. And that's probably what a phone should be, is a communication device. So get her a phone. Well, what's the next step? Well, what do, what do most 7th and 8th grade girls and boys want? Well, we want to have social networking, right? Well, not yet. She makes her own decisions one day. But right now, no social networking. Does have the phone. But here's, here's the thing. Let's look at some ways that it can be simple. Let's look at some ways that social networking has roots of people. Now, I'm not telling you that today that the goal of this lesson is for everybody to go home and never use social networking, and that is not the goal of this lesson. If you choose to use Facebook or go on YouTube or Twitter, those things, I don't, I don't think that's sinful in itself, okay? Please don't misunderstand me here. But it can become sinful, just like anything in life, right? There's many things we do on a daily basis that are not sinful but can become sinful. So social networking is one of those things. So that's what I want to talk about mainly uh, this morning. The first reason, you know, this is a list that can have a lot of points, but I'm only going to have two main points that sort of have these sub-points. But the first one is this addiction. Maybe you've got an addictive personality. You, you pick something up and you really get to it. I've got a friend who has an addictive personality, and he tells a story about he used to hunt. Well, it's getting into hunting season. You can imagine what he was like during hunting. You know, he said he lived and breathed. Well, finally, he, that passion subsided. He got into weightlifting. Well, you know what he looked like a year later, right? Because he's got an addictive personality. When he gets into something, he's into it. Well, I think social media is the new nicotine. You know, it, it's, it's got addictive traits, qualities. Even so much that sometimes, you know, 
you'll find yourself on your phone looking at stuff and, and you didn't even realize you're doing it. It's just addictive. It's just hack. And I think of that as a quality that can be dangerous for us as Christians in the role that we're supposed to have on this earth, our responsibilities. You can imagine someone who has children, they're addicted to social media, and how they're neglecting their children, their responsibilities at work. What do you think social media has done to the workforce? Do you think people at work are having a harder time staying off their phones or their computers or their devices? Because do you think it's changed? What about drivers? I'm sure this is, doesn't happen in Mississippi, only in Alabama. <laughs> But when we're driving down the road sometimes in Sheffield, Alabama, uh, Muscle Shows, all that stuff, you'll see, you drive up somebody that's been swerving and you get up, you know, at the red light and you look in and, and what's happening? They got their social media out right there. You know, they can't put it down. Now, I'm not suggesting every once in a while we don't all get a call while we're driving and, you know, we'll hit the button to answer the follow on sync or, or pick up and answer the call. But it's so addictive in a trait for so many that you can't put it down at all. As you see on that screen there, this is a chart just to give you an idea. Look at this with me here. Do you know that if you take the averages here, this is just simply averages. Now, I'm not telling you that these numbers are perfect or that you can bank on this. You know, this is like any kind of chart that they've done with statistics. It doesn't guarantee anything. It's just an idea, okay? So please, don't take this to the bank. Use it as, a, as an idea. If a person took the average time that, that users are using these things, at the bottom it says they would spend five years and four months of their life on social media. Now, that's five years and four months people used to not spend on social media. Uh, maybe we used that used to on television or something else. Again, there was other things before social media. It's the current thing. But when you think about this for a minute, it can be addictive. And that those, those numbers show us that. And I love this picture here. It's just a cartoon image to illustrate the idea that it, it's like blood for some people. You, you can see it's like they got to get the, it, you know, it's their life blood. they got to have it. If you took it away from them, it would be like taking oxygen from them. You ever seen somebody when they take away that's addicted to drugs or alcohol, and they take drugs or alcohol away from them for a short time, how at first it's just like really hard on them physically because they're addicted. Maybe you can understand maybe with caffeine. Maybe you try to separate yourself from coffee or uh, Dr. Pepper or something at one time, and for a little while you start having those withdrawal periods. Try to take away social media from some of these people. I don't know how many of you work in a school system, but uh, when I first graduated college, that's what I did. Was I taught school and coach boys basketball, as I alluded to earlier. And you want to get a kid upset, you give them an F, it don't bother them. It's not that you gave them an F, they earned the F. But they get an F, they're fine, they can live with it. They get in trouble, they can live with it. You take their phone, oh boy, they'll lose their mind. And I think the uh, same with adults too that are addicted to these things. You know, for some people, social media, and, and I may use that instead of social networking at times, is exciting. It's something to constantly look forward to, to be plugged in. But what happens for some is it's anxiety. Hey, I put a picture up of me and my family on vacation and John didn't say how much he liked it. Does John not like me anymore? Have I made them mad? Did we do something to offend them at church? I can't. Brian didn't say anything about this. We went to a gospel meeting and put a picture. He didn't say a word. He must not like us anymore. Yeah, I, and you said, and imagine a teenager, and this ain't just teenagers, adults do this. But, uh, you know, their, their minds haven't fully really developed, their maturity is lacking. Oh, my boyfriend didn't read my message, my girlfriend didn't. And it's just this panic, this anxiety. Or, What's going on? Do they not approve of this? Do they not see this? I better send them something else. I better reunite. And for some people, it starts to consume our time, our energy, and our mind. I think that's the biggest handicap of social media is the time it starts to suck away from our lives, our energy. And it starts to get the best of so many people. It becomes an idol, and it steals from doing or having time for more important matters. In other words, when God said in the Old Testament, as they had the Ten Commandments, no idols, no idols. This is a modern day idol in some sense. It's become a God to many people. Let's look at some passages that go with this idea of addiction. Let's start in Matthew chapter 6 at verse 13. Matthew chapter 6 at verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know what that is right there? That is Jesus teaching them to pray. 
Now, I hope maybe you use that in your prayer from time to time. I've got a lesson on that. Lead us not into temptation. If my goal is to be a Christian, get to heaven, and I'm asking the Lord, Lord, help me, and lead me not to temptation, and I pick up my phone, and I go to social media, I, a lot of times I'm being led right to temptation. And here's some of the temptation. I'm going to spend another hour on this that I could have been doing something better with. I, you fill in the blank. You don't have to say study in my Bible. Sure, that'd be a great hour. Or visiting with someone that's an elderly Christian or helping someone in need or just doing something useful. That's an hour wasted. Lead me not to temptation. All right, here's another way. Lead me not to temptation. I get on there and I see something that so-and-so put and it makes me mad. I can't believe they are voting for it. Harris or Trump, whichever, you know, I can't believe that. Now, I, now I'm, I'm never, t I don't support them anymore. Boy, I lost some confidence in them. And all of a sudden, I think these things, and maybe I don't even know they put it on there. Maybe, maybe somehow they, is some accident, you know. My fingers, when I try to text, I type three letters at once. Maybe that's what, I don't know. But what happens is, if we're led to temptation, here, here's this young man. And he's battling lust. And he gets on there, and these girls in his high school class or his college class, they just went to the beach. And they posted all these pictures at the beach in their beach wear. Okay, you know where I'm going with that, right? Uh, and they're like, man, you can about see everything they got. You think that'd be difficult for someone that's struggling with lust? And, and somebody put it out there for them to see. They're not ashamed of this. They're, hey, look, I'm not ashamed of my nakedness. And so what happens is, is now... I've walked right into this temptation to look at something I should look at, to say something I shouldn't say, to waste time. And again, I, I understand there are times that it's useful, so please, I'm trying to be fair here. But in the, the rule of fairness, there's a lot of addiction and waste there. And that idea of this prayer, lead me not to temptation, picking that up a lot of times is going right to the temptation. So we just have to consider the temptations that are there. And is it really worth it? Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 at verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 at verse 8. Let's go and see what Peter has to say here. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now listen, Satan may not get you with drugs or alcohol. He may not get you with lying, but he's getting a lot of Christians with social media. That, that's one of his new toys. That's one of his new tools of how he's reaching others that he couldn't get with other ways to sin. This is one of the ways where he's, he's able to get people and trip them up in their faith. He's causing people to stumble. In Ephesians chapter 5 at verse 16. Ephesians 5 at verse 16. He says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You ever had moments of your life where you regretted things? Boy, when my kids were in my home, I wish I'd have done things a little different. When I had my grandparents alive, I wish I'd spent more time. Maybe you've got any kind of regret with time. Anybody that lives will have regrets with time. That's, that's life. Do you think maybe one day we'll look back and have regrets with time with this social network? I think it'll happen. I think it happens in the day where it's like, man, I just watched this for 30 minutes. I don't even know what I'm watching. I don't even know what's going on here. It's just a waste of time because it was just alluring. It, it caught my attention. It, I was addicted, so I just kept going back for more. In James chapter 4, verse 17. <clears throat> James, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse. James says something here that's just real simple that gets straight to the point. He says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, doeth not to him, it is sin. You know what that means? It means as a Christian, there are certain things in the Scripture we have sins of omission, okay, and sins of commission, Right? Sins of commission are what we normally think of. Doing something you're told not to do. But you remember back in school when you would have a test and there would be that one question and on the, it would say omit. You don't have to do this. Well, a lot of times as Christians, we get responsibilities and duties we're supposed to do. Things we have to do. But we fail to do it. We, we commit that sin of omission. Well, because of addiction for so many people, they're not doing this passage. They, they've got a lot of good things they're supposed to be doing that they're not doing and that's sin. Because they're caught up in other things. They're addicted to social media. And it's prohibiting them from getting done their duties and obligations. What about 1 Corinthians 15, 33? I quoted this earlier, but uh, Paul's, he talked to Corinthians, says, evil companionships corrupt good morals. I wouldn't let my kid go to this place on a Friday night because I know who's going to be there. I know what's going to be going on, right? Amen? 
But I'll let my kid get on social media where there's predators, there's people saying and doing things that are just as bad as Friday Night with Friday Night with people who, who knows who it is and what's saying what's happening. But I'll let them go there. Does that make any sense? But it makes sense, right? Because we see it happen. It don't make sense in, in logic, but we see that it happens. No, I'm, you can't go there because I know who's going to be there, what's going on. But social media, we go there with people we don't know, with things going on that shouldn't be going on. So that's something to consider. Evil companionships, corrupt good morals. Who am I social networking with? How are they influencing me? How is this changing my life for better or for worse? And I'm afraid a lot of stuff we see on there is pure evil. A lot of the things that are out there are sin. The second reason that social media and social networking can be sinful is it brings out bad qualities and emotions. The scripture is very emphatic on some of this stuff, and I want to make sure that we bring this out. But let's start on this picture. Now look, I, I just find these pictures and use them. I know some of those words you're like, I cannot see that. Please understand. I, I'll try to help you with this here. But it says negative effects of social media, depression, anxiety, less self-control, overeating, hive mindset, FOMO, or fear of missing out, PTSD trigger, lower self-esteem. Let's talk about a few of these and see how they relate to being a Christian. What about the hive mindset? I like that one because it's different. You know what the hive mindset is? It's like where 10, 15 people, then all of a sudden it's 100 people, and then you just jump in, right? It's Miss Mead gave my child a B on her test. My child don't make Bs. So I get on there and I say, Miss Mead is the worst teacher in all foreign county history, right? And then what happens is, is another parent sees it that's friends with me, and they're like, you're right, she gave my child B too, and I, she don't teach, and she's a terrible person. And then another person, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's this hive. You know, people are in, they don't even know what they're saying or doing. They just, there's a big group doing it, let's jump in. All of a sudden, well, how, how do we wind up here? That FOMO, fear of missing out, I remember being a teenager, I remember being a kid, don't you? We understand the idea of fear of missing out. We, we want to be accepted. We want to be in the crowd. We want to be popular. Maybe you wouldn't use those words, but you understand the idea. As adults, it's probably the same way. People have this fear of missing out. And remember, if we miss out on part of life and we get to heaven, that's fine. We want to lose our life here to save it, then. We don't want to save our life here to lose it, then. It's okay, because some of the things we're missing out on are terrible things. They're unrewarding. They're unsatisfying. They're evil. So don't feel like you're missing out on certain things. I can say all the time I've spent on social networking and my experiences with it, I don't know how much of it really does me, does me a lot of good. When it's all said and done, you know, I'll get on there to look something up about my favorite team, you know, the University of Florida. And then at the end of the day, by the next year, that's just forgotten. We're on to a new year. It's like, well, that was a lot of waste of time, if I'm being honest. And I'm sure we could all admit that a lot of this. But what about these qualities and emotions that come out? Depression, anxiety. How about a few others? How about pride? Do you think the Lord loves pride in His people? Look with me in Proverbs chapter 16 at verse 5 and verse 18. I can't give you all the verses on pride because we would be here for a long time because there's a lot of passages we could read. So what I want to do is just look at a few. So in Proverbs 16, as Solomon's writing, look at verse 5 and verse 18 of chapter 16. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, there's a lot more verses I could read, but maybe those two get you thinking a lot. You know what social network can do for pride? I bought a truck back in 2014 from Long Lewis Ford in Muscle Shows. And after I bought the truck, the lady that so to me, Tracy, she said, Hey, listen, we want to get your picture with that truck. We put all our new parts in there. And I'm not suggesting that this is the worst thing, or if you've ever done this, I'm just sharing with you the story here. I said, I don't want my picture on there for that truck. You know, I, don't, I don't want everybody to know I got a new truck, okay? Because then you got to answer a thousand questions. Oh, you got this new truck. Must, you know, they must be paying teachers a lot of money, huh? Well, go be a teacher. You're missing out. And so, you know, you've got that aspect of it. And then you've got this aspect, too, of, you know, hey, not everybody's got a new truck, right? And maybe that'll affect somebody. Maybe they'll look at you. Or maybe, you know, they're going to be sitting there saying, well, I wish I had a new truck. You know, and maybe, maybe they're having a tough time in life where it's like, oh, no, I need this truck, got the truck, let it be. 
I don't have to share this with everybody and let it be a prideful moment like it may be for some. And then also you got this side of, of, of this idea of we got to share everything. You know, our book, our, our life has to be this open book for everybody about everything. That Again, people like to share. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's moments that's good. But it's like, hey, have I thought about how what I'm sharing is affecting others? Is this really something that, that could help them? Because there might be things you can share that help others, that are good. And there might be things that later looking at, oh, that probably wasn't the best idea. And I've done things like that. And a lot of things you say to people, it's the same premise. That later, oh, probably shouldn't have said that. Probably shouldn't have said that in hindsight. But pride happens all over. We just got back from our seventh trip to the beach this year. You know, we've been to the mountains four times. And then, you know, what's on? You know, honey, you ain't took me to the beach once this year. Yeah. Honey, we ain't been to the mountains since we've been married. You know, so it's like, now I'm not a good husband, right? You know, that, now we're not keeping up with the Joneses is, is essentially what I'm saying, right? We, we don't go anywhere. Man, we live a boring life. You know, and, and so what happens is your mind here go crazy on this stuff. And then sometimes it's like, yeah, but we're trying to pay our bills and that can get us way into debt. And some people, that's how they're living, right? They'd rather spend it that way. And that's their own personal choice. But at the same time, pride is all over these things. And you'll see that next time you're looking, pay attention, you'll notice that. What about nakedness? I brought this up earlier, but it can lead to, to lust, adultery, and fornication. Have you ever heard of any marriages that have been broken up since social media came around? Well, I found out so-and-so was sending pictures. Somebody, or they've been talking to their ex-boyfriend from high school or their ex-husband or somebody they work with. They got to, I mean, you know what happens. You know this. Here's the beauty of it for for the people of my generation and above. We didn't have that temptation. You didn't have to worry about sending out a dumb uh, picture or looking at something you because it wasn't available. So thank the Lord for that. And some saying it's right because maybe we'd have done something really dumb. But the generation underneath us—that's the challenge they're having to face. And we need to make sure that we're being a good example that we're teaching on these things and not ignoring these things. We need to remind them, hey. This is important because you could mess your life up. You could put something out there that you think you deleted, but it's there forever. So be careful with this idea of nakedness because it may not just be the nakedness and the lust here, but it could lead to more things like fornication, adultery, things that, that we know are sinful. What about gossip? In case you've never heard of gossip, it's saying things about people we shouldn't, right? Saying things that may not be true. Maybe we heard this and we want to share this rumor. Do you think that happens on social media? Probably not. I think half of what we read on there nowadays is fake with all the AI and with the election coming up. What can you believe in some of these things? So when it comes to this stuff, we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in the gossip part. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, if you'll turn there and read this, Paul's talking to the Ephesians here. Notice what he says. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. All right, before I type that, is this good communication proceeding out of my mouth? No, probably not. Shouldn't I? But I really want to say it. I really want to get it out there. Is it, is it good? Is this going to do good? No. Is saying that I really don't like this person or I can't believe she did it, nah, it's probably not very good. Probably not, probably not a word I'm going to be judged by on the day of judgment because I will be judged by my words, right? So that's something to think about. Is it corrupt communication? In Proverbs chapter 21 at verse 23, going back to Solomon here, notice what the wise man says. Proverbs 21 at verse 23. Whosoever keeps his mouth and his tongue Keeps his soul from trouble. Amen. You know, I did a lesson at Piney Grove last week on taming the tongue. And do you know how many verses I had just from the book of Proverbs and Psalms that talked about the tongue and the troubles it can get us in? And James talks about that in James 3. No man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly fire full of deadly evil. What about our tongues? Again, I can't look think that we could walk out of here and say, I've never said anything I regret. I think that'd probably be a lie. I try not to say something I regret at least, you know, once a week, right? To my wife or to somebody. It's like, this is tough. This, that's why James said it. This is tough. But when you're typing it, that's saying. When you're reading it and you're putting your voice behind it that I like this, I agree with this, you're, you're giving it your consent, right? 
You're saying, I approve of what this person put because I'm backing it up. And you're supporting that. You're supporting that person in that. And we need to be careful about that. What about envy? I mentioned the envy already sort of in the pride. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 19 through 21. And notice in this list some of the words you find here. Now the words of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, we've talked about that in this lesson. Fornication, seen that. Uncleanness, lasciviousness. Idolatry, we mentioned that. Witchcraft, hatred. I think you see hatred on social networking. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife. I know you see strife. Seditions, her heresies. And listen to this next word, verse 21. In Envies, another word we might use would be jealousy. Murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like. Of the which I tell you, before as I've told you in times past, that they which do such things. Now listen, he gives this list and he concludes it by saying, if you're doing these things, well, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he's not saying if you ever did this, you, you're never going to, you can repent. You can, but if you're constantly practicing these things, and you're engaged in these things willfully, there's a problem. That's not the type of things that are going to be in heaven. That's not the type of people that go to heaven. And I have to believe social media, social networking brings out envy at its finest. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, again, a passage from Paul here. Notice what he says to the Corinthians here. For you are not carnal, for whereas there is among you envy, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? This shouldn't be so. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. But yet you see envy practice on these platforms. The Scripture tells us what to think on. Brian read this earlier, but it tells us, if you notice in the picture there, you see symptoms that are common to drug addiction that are also present in those who excessively use social media. And again, if you can't read those small words, one says preoccupation with social media, building a tolerance. In other words, hey, it used to take uh, two beers to make a person drunk. Now it's got to take 10 because they've built up a tolerance. Used to, I'd stay on my phone for 10 or 15 minutes. Now it's like for hours. I've built up a tolerance. And by phone, I'm, I'm talking about social networking here. Maybe it's a computer, laptop, or device you use. And then it's lying about the time spent on it. Well, I don't do drugs. I only had one beer. I only smoked one. And I said, no, you're drunk. You're intoxicated. You're in very bad shape. You're addicted to these drugs and this alcohol. No, you didn't just spend a few minutes. You're addicted to it. If I took away your social media device that you could have for a week, you would go through serious withdrawals. Maybe you've met someone that maybe you can understand that. And then people use it for an escapism. It's a way to escape. And they neglect their personal life. You know, I've seen pictures, you know, back when I was a kid growing up, the Nintendo 64 was popular, you know. And they had these images of these kids sitting in the, in a, a, a room playing. There's, you know, four teenage boys playing, and they've got their, it looks like nobody's cleaned the room in a week. There's pizza boxes and drinks, you know. It's like, we're into this game, right? And then you've got some people who sit by their computer or their phone, and it's just like, house is destroyed. Life's out of control. What's going on? This addiction's taken over. And it's just consumed. So going back to what Brian read in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, I want to read this verse again. And as we read this verse this time, think about it in the context of this lesson. All right, think about your time spent on any social networking platform. Now, I'm sure somebody in this audience, this lesson is not real beneficial because you don't have any, and it means nothing to you. But I'm sure some people this means a lot. So as you think about using social networking in any form, think about it in this verse, okay? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, whatever things are lovely and of a good report, if there's any virtue and there's any praise, think on these things. Now, let's think about Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, all those things. Now, if you go to YouTube to figure out how to fix your lawnmower, bless you. Uh, good idea. Great, great use of YouTube. I don't know what Twitter's good for, or Twitter, uh, TikTok. I haven't found one thing out TikTok's actually beneficial for. Maybe you can help me after service. But what I'm saying is maybe some of you use some of this for news. It has, there's good uses for anything. Some of them, I still haven't found a good use at all. But have you ever been on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook and said, I'm on here because these things are true, just, and good? 
I have a lovely report. I can't believe that would be that would be the reason. I came on here to see some good news. I came on here, you know, maybe you got on there to see one of Brian's lessons he's posted. That probably a good thing. Or maybe you got on there for a lot of other different reasons. I just want to see what's going on. I just want to keep up with it. It's just something I like to do. And the next time you do these things, if you're having a struggle with this, and maybe it's become a temptation or an addiction or to bring out bad emotions, probably think about this verse. And think about, is this helping me draw closer to God or not? And it might be the time to say, hey, I need to give some of this stuff up. I need to make some changes. And that's fair. That's what the preaching of the Lord's Word should do. It should make us think about our lives and how we can grow closer to God instead of going away from God. With social networking, the final rule is this as we conclude. You've got to have rule over it and not it over you. That's, that's the bottom line. It's like anything in life that's not sinful that can become sinful. Do you rule it or does it rule you? Is it your master or are you its master? Does that make sense? I, I think that makes perfect sense. Look at Genesis chapter 4 verse 7 and hopefully some of these passages will help it make perfect sense if it doesn't already. In Genesis chapter 4 at verse 7 you should know the story very well where we have Cain and Abel. And I'll read verse 6 to give it a little more context. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you mad? Why are you wroth? And why is your countenance fallen? What's going on, Cain? God knows, just like He knows with us. If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Do you rule over social media, or does it rule over you? Does sin have a hold on you, and it's ruling your life? You know what? I have the worst trouble with poison oak. Man, that's, that's one of the downfalls in life. I've mentioned my asthma to a few people earlier, but I'm still fine. But boys know it does not like me. I, no, it does like me. Let me rephrase that. I'm the kind, when I get it, I have to go to the doctor and get a cortisone shot because, I mean, I don't look like, you know, I mean, I could do a commercial for poison oak if it was a brain because I get it that bad. It's in my blood. It's all over me. I'm itching. You can rub lotion on me, calamine. It ain't going to work. It's just laughing at it, you know? So I got to do the big stuff. I got to get a cortisone shot and get well. That's what seems like to some people. It gets in their blood, and it just takes over, and it consumes. And sometimes we've got to figure out how to get, you know, go to the great position and get that shot. That shot of zeal and the, the things that we got to do to, to overcome it and fix it. And I think that's the idea here. Do we rule over it or does it, does it have control of us? In James chapter 4, verse 7. James 4, verse 7. He says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. I know a man that I really respect that used to smoke when he was young. He smoked, you know, cigarettes. And he made a change in life said, I don't need to do this anymore. And I think during his generation, it was very popular and they didn't understand all the effects of it. So he made a decision, I don't want to fix this, I'm going to quit. And he did. And I respect him so much for, for that because I know that was hard. And I've seen people that have made other decisions like that where the physical they have to make some changes on how they eat and what they drink because their health has, has changed. Maybe right? they've developed diabetes or something. But he, he gave up smoke. Well, think about that last part. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I'm sure he sees advertisement for cigarettes and he smells it when he goes by somebody that is smoking. And I imagine that probably affects him. But do you think that it's as hard for him to say no today as it was the day he quit? I think over time it gets easier and easier for him because he's been that far away from it. If there's something in your life that's like this, maybe it's social network or something, it may be hard for a while, but the further you get away from it, the easier it'll be and you'll forget about it. I'm not an emailer at all. I don't know why we still have email since we have text messages, but we have email. Brian sent me one this week and read it because he told me to send it. If it wouldn't, I probably wouldn't check it. I've probably got three email addresses from when I had to have them, but I probably got thousands of emails that I hadn't checked. And I think about that, and I think, you know what? Every once in a while it pops in my head. Oh, I still have that email from UNA. You know, MD Dower, what, UNA, whatever. ED. And I'm like, you know what? I should go in there, and I, I bet I got four or 5,000 emails. It's like, I forgot about it. I just don't really care. I didn't have anything important tied to it. I think that's what happens here. The further we get away, it's like, hey, I'm not worried about getting on social media anymore because it really wouldn't do anything for me. I'd gotten addicted to something that was really not that beneficial. In Matthew chapter 6, at verse 24. Matthew 26, at verse 4.
Hey, excuse me, Matthew 6, let me get that right, at verse 24. We'll be reading about Jesus on the cross. I'm not sure that would be applicable here for what we're studying. But in Matthew 6, verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I understand mammon here is probably not talking about social network, but I think it's the same idea. It's hard to serve God when we've got something on this earth that's become our God. That's become more important to us. And I would say, to, to make this fair, that most people send, spend more time in social networking than they do in prayer and study. I think that's what I'm trying to say. If you had to weigh right, my time in prayer study, which the Bible doesn't say, you've got to study and pray this much to be a Christian. It doesn't say that. But if you were to weigh that time in Bible study and prayer or assembly of saints versus social networking, for most Christians, I'm not talking about non-Christians, for most Christians, it would still be social networking winning out by a, a landslide for most people that are Christians. Outside the church, you, you already know it. But even within the church, I'm afraid it'd probably be close to the same. So in conclusion, is social networking a problem in your life or in the life of someone you love? This image shows it all. Everywhere you go now, you see it. We go out to eat. We eat at home. People are... They're not conversation talking, and, and I'm just as guilty at times of that. I can't pretend I haven't been. Or maybe I'm texting or calling somebody. But what about your spiritual life? How has it affected your spiritual life? And what can you do about it? I want to look at two more verses unless there's In Matthew 5, verse 30. Matthew chapter 5, verse 30. Notice what Jesus says here. And if your right hand offends you, cut it off. And cast it from you, for it is more profitable that you that one of your members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. That's pretty blunt, ain't it? That's not my suggestion. That's Christ's suggestion. If your hand's causing you to sin, cut it off because you'd rather go to heaven missing that hand than be in hell with your whole body. That's what he's saying. If your eyes offend you, pluck it out. If your foot's offend you, cut it off. What's he saying by that? Is he literally saying, get something cut? That's not his true suggestion. His true suggestion is, Fix it. If it's your feet leading you somewhere you shouldn't go, stop going. If your eyes are looking at something that you shouldn't be looking at, quit looking at it. If it's your hand pulling that up, it, quit doing it. Have rule over it. That's what Jesus' suggestion is. Take care of it. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, the last time we'll turn this morning, Paul writing Colossians here, in Colossians 3, 17, with a verse that I think you're going to be very well aware of, says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. There's a lot of things people do on social networking that is not in the name of the Lord Jesus, nor would they want Him to know about. So, is social networking a problem in your life? Or in the life of someone you love? You know what you can do about it? Cut it off. Fix it. Make some changes. <clears throat> Don't allow it to be a stumbling block or distraction from your purpose here on earth. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. Everyone here that's here this morning's goal is to get to heaven. And if your goal is to get to heaven and you're not a child of God, you have an opportunity now to, to fix that. To go from being unsaved to being in a safe condition. And you've got a group of people here that whether you know them well or not, we love you and we care for you. And our Lord and Savior does as well. He gave His life for you. And God's long-suffering and His grace and His mercy and unconditional love has made it to this very day. Maybe so that you could become a child of God. Maybe so that you could make some changes. Hopefully that something from His Word this morning has pricked your heart and helped you draw closer to Him so that you don't miss that home of heaven and that crown of life. But if you're here this morning and you need to become a child of God, let, let's encourage this one to do that. If we can help you in that way, we want to do that. Whatever, whatever way we can help you, please let us know. And if you've done that but you have not been faithful after becoming a child of God, and you've gotten off that straight and narrow path, what a good time to be honest. A good time to realize the urgency of now and say, let's fix this. Let's make some changes now. While you've got people around you that care about you and want to help you. If we can do anything for you, please let it be known. If we stand and sing the song that's been selected.